Did you know that North Korea was once a thriving center of Christian community and worship? Pyongyang, the capital, was known as the Jerusalem of the East in the early 1900s because of its 2,000 plus churches in the capital city. But when the Kim family began to lead and, and rule, they set themselves up as divine beings, quite literally. Um, and they created this pseudo-religion uh, called Jucha, based on the tenets of self-reliance, autonomy, and independence. And the worship of the Kim family. And under this oppressive regime, currently headed by Kim Jong-un, Christians have been forced to worship in underground settings. Juchi is a distinctly North Korean religious ideology that requires worship and subservience to the Kim family only. Christianity is considered, therefore, subversive to the Kim family. And it's brutally opposed. Anyone discovered to be a Christian or to express any interest in Christ or the Bible is automatically considered an enemy of the state. The gospel, though, is still proclaimed in North Korea through various creative means, including shortwave radio. Now, there are bold evangelists who risk their lives to smuggle Bibles and discipleship resources into the country. The North Korean government now allows no religious freedom, requiring all North Koreans to follow the Juchi religion. If discovered, Christians face harsh, harsh persecution from the government. But not only from the government, also from members of, of their community. See that the entire population of North Korea are forced to serve as government informants to root out any subversive thought, which Christianity would clearly be. Even those who are aware of Christian activity but do not report it to the government are often punished as enemies. Of the regime, so just just knowing about it, you're you're not involved in it. You have no desire to be involved in it, but you know about it, and you didn't report it, would lead you to be punished and persecuted as well. When Christians are caught, they're sent to prison and labor camps, where they're starved, overworked, and routinely tortured. The government. It's a requirement that all North Koreans act as a for, in, informants even flows down to the families. As children, children are taught in school to spy on their parents from a very young age and to report any hint of any kind of subversive activity such as Christianity. The North Korean Christians must be extremely careful in what they say and what they do and how they pray. When a Christian is discovered, the government punishes the entire family in order to incentivize reporting. And despite the threat of persecution and heavy social pressure, Christians in North Korea hold firmly to their faith. Today, it's estimated there are about 30,000 Christians currently suffering in prison and labor camps as we speak this morning. Now, I'm, I'm telling you about North Korean Christians for two reasons this morning. First, I would encourage you to remember these brothers and sisters in your prayers. As you are praying for the world in general, I, I hope this would spur you to remember them specifically. But second, Psalm 69 is about what to do when we are persecuted for our faith, 
when we are persecuted for our belief in God. David is going to show us how we, as Christians, should respond to persecution for our faith this morning. And we will see David's response in in five sections in Psalm 69. Again, it's a little bit longer, so I couldn't fit it into three like a good Baptist preacher would. But but there's five kind of broad sections that I want to address, and that's how this sermon will be organized. First, in verses 1 through 4, ask God to save you. Ask God to save you. Second, in verses 5 through 6, confess your own sinful behavior. Confess your own sinful behavior. Third, recognize that you are suffering because of your faith. We'll see that in verses 7 through 12. Fourth, cast yourself on God's mercy and love and keep praying that God will redeem you. Fifth, and finally, in verses 29 through 36, praise God's name. Praise God's name. So let's jump in and look at this this morning. In Psalms 69, verses 1 through 4, we're going to see that we need to cry out to God to save or deliver us. David starts this psalm by saying, save me, O God. For, for the waters have come upon my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary from crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs on my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me. Those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore. Last week we saw, if you were here, how the psalmist kind of mapped his experience on the Exodus experience. Right? And, and so he, he kind of showed how he, he felt that he was caught in a trap. And this was the, the, the captivity of the Egyptians and, and bring being brought into bondage and slavery under a hard taskmaster that ultimately God redeeming and saving them through the wilderness and bringing them to the promised land. Well, this week, David is mapping his current situation over Noah's flood. And you're going to see this all throughout this psalm. There is this theme of drowning. And, and that's what persecution can feel like. I mean, just, just imagine for a second being a North Korean Christian. And you can't, you, you don't know who you can talk to. You, you don't know who you can trust. You, you can't trust your child who's going to school and being taught to spy on you. And you're struggling with something. Here in America, we have it so good because we can pick up the phone and call a brother and sister. We can go have coffee and sit down or lunch and and meet with someone and pour our hearts out to them and not have to worry about what the restaurant hears. But I can imagine under this kind of persecution, it would just feel suffocating like you are drowning, like the entire world is pushing you down. And that's how David says he, he's feeling right now. He's, he's crying out to God as, as though there is this flood that is coming over him. Hamilton points out that this imagery of the flood gets developed again in Psalm 124. So if you want some homework, go read Psalm 124 and look at how he expands it there into being the nation of Israel. So not just him individually is being drowned, but the entire nation of Israel is being drowned by all of the forces around him. Later we see in Mark 10, Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking when the disciples asked to sit on the left and right of him. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink 
or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And this baptism, Jesus refers here not to a literal one, but instead God's judgment for the world being poured out on him the way it was poured out on the whole world during the flood. And so there's this this kind of theme, this this running through the Bible, starting with the flood of, of Noah, going all the way to Jesus, where the wrath and the, 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 the justice of God is poured out upon him, flooding him. It also informs what Peter says about our baptism being like a flood. And this morning... I think this is encouraging to us as believers because one, we, we need to be realistic about our difficulties. Don't act like everything is okay when everything is not okay. Life is hard. We, we live in a, in a world filled with sin, filled with sinful people who are trying nothing more than to drown each and every one of us. And so we learn from David. I I hope you will learn from David this morning that sometimes it's okay to not be okay. This isn't license to go around complaining about everything. But but there, there are legitimate forces at work against us as believers this morning. And it's okay to say, you know what? I'm not doing okay. I'm struggling. This, this is one of the, the benefits, it should be the benefit, of having a small group that you're actively a part of. So that you can go and sit with a small group of people and say, you know what, I'm not doing okay. This is what I'm struggling with. And have that group pray with you, pray for you. Check on you throughout the week. We, we had a couple of people in our small group that they were gone just all month, just Thing after thing, every weekend, they they were like, look, we're not going to be a small group this month. We just have so many commitments. It's all just kind of hit in one month. But but that allowed us to pray for them. That that when they weren't there, that we made it a a matter, a a point to say, you know what, Lord, please protect them. They're they're traveling, they're flying, they're, they're driving. Whatever it is, protect them. We need that place to be able to be honest about not being okay. This morning, as you're sitting here, can you relate to how David is feeling? Have you ever felt like you were just drowning in this life? Like, like so, you, you've prayed so much, you can't even talk. <laughs> And, and David's like, I just, I, I can't see you. I can't see you do it. It's, it's almost like David's saying, look, I, I, I'm, I'm crying out and you're just not hearing me. At least that's the way I feel. You're not seeing me. Again, at least that's the way he feels. We need to cry out to God to save us. And then second, we need to confess our own sinful behavior. Verses 5 through 6. Oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. O oh Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me. O oh God of Israel. You know what David is saying in verse 6? This is profound this morning. Because normally when I find myself in this place, I'm just being honest and I, and I feel like the world's drowning and drowning me and pushing me down. I tend to think it's all about me. You ever, anybody else relate to that? Am I the only one? Right? But what David is saying is verse 6. David is saying, I'm not the point. It's not about me. Don't make it so that That his sin brings shame on the Lord. He's saying like, Lord, don't let my sin, which is a lot. Whatever he's being persecuted for now, it's not the sin he committed. 
Okay, he, he, he's being asked to restore something he didn't steal. This is, he's being accused of something he didn't do in the psalm. But yet David is wise enough to know that he is plenty sinful. Whatever this persecution, whatever this attack is, is illegitimate. But he knows his heart well enough to know, but I've done a lot of other things. Right? This is, when anybody confronts you about your sin whether they are right or whether they are wrong. Your first thought should always be, if you only knew the half of it. Now, they may not be right. They may be completely off base. But if they knew the half of what you think or what you have done, they wouldn't be too far off base. And so David is saying, look, I I understand that I am a sinful man. And I don't want you to make this about me. I don't want my foolishness, my folly, my weakness to put your name to shame. I don't want other people's walk with you, God, to be affected because of my foolishness david is more concerned about others than he is himself now what we can learn from that this morning is this is what holiness looks like i think sometimes we have a weird skewed view of what holiness looks like we 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 think about these people who go out and and just they're all alone and it's just them and God and and they just spend all this time with God by themselves and it's like oh man that's a that's a holy guy but the first step after salvation toward holiness is when we are more concerned about others than ourselves you see that guy who goes out into the mountain and lives with God alone <laughs> That's the easy thing to do. (laughs) Hang out with his people. (laughs) Love his people, right? Feed his sheep. The ones that bite and fall into the same hole over and over and over and over and over again. And then blame you for falling into the hole. Right? That's hard. But that's also holiness. Holiness is not something you do by yourself. Holiness is something that is seen when you care more about the other than you care about yourself. Now, practically, what is, what is David saying here? Don't let my sinfulness impact others. So practically, I'm going to live the most sin-free life I possibly humanly can. Why? So that others will see jesus it's not about them seeing me and going oh dale is so holy he is such a holy dude i mean everything it's just it's just amazing when i'm with him because i just oh it's amazing no it should be they see jesus because i love them because i care for them and the same thing is true with you that, that even though they bite your hand, slap your face, call you names, you still love them and you care for them. This is what holiness looks like. David doesn't want those who look up to him as the king to be put to shame. Third, we need to recognize When we are suffering because of our faith. We see that in verses 7 through 12. Here David talks about in verse 8. I've become a stranger to my brothers. An alien to my mother's sons. David's own family is turning against him. And we know this because of Absalom. And all the other things that were going on inside the house of David. Um. 
And this may be one of the things that David is referring to here. Again, there's not a lot of specifics in this psalm, so we don't really know the exact details. But, but David is lamenting here that his own family, his own flesh and blood, this is that the, they're treating him like a stranger or an alien, a, a, as someone who is just completely unknown and foreign to them, right? That, that's the experience that David is having under this persecution. And, and man, that's, that's a hard thing. It's hard when your own family disowns you. I don't, I don't know if you've ever experienced that or walked through that with other people, but like it, that, that's, that's, it's a painful, painful thing to experience. When the people who are supposed to love you and care for you just, I don't even, don't even know you exist. That, that's the pain that David is feeling from this persecution in this psalm. He's referring to his siblings, his, his brothers by blood, when he says, my mother's sons, rather than just fellow Israelites in general. And notice in verse 12, it's, it's not only the, the righteous that are against him, but even the drunks are making fun of him. Right? I am the talk of those who sit in the gate. In other words, everybody's gossiping. And the drunkards make songs about me. <laughs> they're, they're going to the bar and they are just creating these tunes about how whatever I am. Right? Whatever it is they're accusing him of. It's not just the righteous, but it's also the unrighteous. This morning we have to remember and know that if, if you openly worship the Lord and you stand for him. You will pay a price. Now we we live in a country with a certain amount of freedom. And so that price may not be as heavy as in a place like North Korea or Saudi Arabia or other places around the world. But you may be rejected by friends and family. I mean, you really start following the Lord. You really start loving others. And your life is going to also not only point to Jesus, but be incredibly convicting. And people will just want, want to be around you. You may be rejected or lose friends or even family members. You may be passed over for a promotion at work. This may be something you never know that happens behind the scenes, but it's like when the Bosses are sitting there and they're deciding. It's like, yeah, let's just, let's not even consider him. He talks about his faith too much. And you may be ridiculed by ungodly people. (laughs) David was. The, The drunkards were making songs about him. Don't be surprised when they make songs about you. In some part of the world, like in North Korea, you may even be imprisoned or put to death. If you openly worship God and you stand for him, you will pay a price. This next section is kind of the long section, but cast yourself on God's mercy and love and keep praying that God will redeem you. And we see that in verses 13 through 28. David responded to his persecution with a stronger commitment to prayer. In verse 13 there. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. This is incredibly convicting to me this morning. Because it's easy when I get into the situation to, again, make it about me. And, and instead of turning back to God, I, I turn toward a pity party. I, I get to that place and it's just, well, 
God's not listening to me. I've been praying so hard. I can't, he can't even talk anymore. I don't feel like he's seeing me. Everybody's making fun of me. What am I doing? But David does something different. David responds to this persecution with an even stronger commitment to his God through prayer. While the ungodly mocked him, he would cast himself on God's mercy, his hesed in Hebrew, his unfailing love for his people. And by calling God uh, the Lord, David emphasized that he was praying to the one who was faithful to his covenant. This was the the covenant-keeping God. And we too should pray that he would rescue us from those who, who hate us and cause us trouble this morning. And David returns to that image that he begins with in this psalm and this illustration of a drowning man. Verse 14, sinking in the mire. Verse 14 and 15, the, the deep waters. Verse 15, the, the, the flood waters. And verse uh, 15, the pit. And David is crying out to God, but he, he found a, a foothold somehow in the, in the miry pit in which he was sinking, and it was God's love and mercy. This is what is saving David at this point. The loving kindness of God's unfailing, steadfast love for us this morning. It's often translated as mercy, and it's one of God's attributes or, or qualities that reveal his unparalleled character. And this, this trait, it, it stirs God to, to offer his covenant to us and to, to keep it with us without fail. But by claiming God's loving kindness, David believed that God would be faithful to his covenant. Notice David's not looking for God to be faithful to him, but to be faithful to his covenant, God's covenant. That's where he's putting his hope and his trust in this psalm. We see that ongoing trouble requires persistent prayer. Some of you are caught up in something that is not a momentary affliction. It is an ongoing affliction. It is something that is happening over and over and over again. And we see from this psalm that we need to be in just as persistent prayer as the persecution is persistent in our lives. You see, when Jesus commanded us to ask, seek, and knock, he used present tense verbs, meaning we are continuously doing these things in Luke 11. Literally, he said, keep on asking, Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. And to illustrate the point, Jesus told of a man who needed his, his neighbor's help at midnight. And at first the neighbor refused due to how late it was. But the man persisted until his neighbor gave him what he needed. This is, this is the kind of persistence that we need to have in our lives when we're facing persecution. This morning, we need to stand on God's promises when we feel like we are sinking and we are being drowned by this world. When we don't receive immediate answers, we go back to God's promises for us. God's love for us is unfailing and it's unconditional. Nothing can separate us from his love, Romans 8, 35 through 39 says. He will answer our prayer and freely give us all that we need, not want, need, Luke 11, 10 through 13. Knowing that this morning, we can commit our lives to him and trust him to care for us. If you're drowning this morning, believer, Don't doubt God. Don't give up. Don't quit praying. 
That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants us to distrust God. He wants us to stop talking to God. David was desperate and David knew God was his only hope. He begged God to come close to him, to to redeem him or, or to ransom his life by setting him free from his enemies in verse 18. Once again, he describes the the unjust persecution he was living through, boldly appealing to God to judge his enemies severely for their cruelty. And finally, in verses 29 through 36, we see David praising God's name. And this is the fifth thing that we need to be doing this morning. The the power of praise sets the captive souls free. The power of praise sets the captive soul free. Even when we are suffering, we should be magnifying the Lord. As David noted, God is pleased when we offer him the sacrifice of praise. And others who are suffering will be encouraged when they observe us praising Him. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before. But but you you come to church and and you're living in community with people and you know what's going on in each other's lives and you know how someone is really suffering and you come in and you just see them praising God. It's a humbling experience, isn't it? It encourages you to know that what you're going through is nothing compared to what they're going through at this moment. Doesn't mean you're not going through a lot, but. And it brings you hope. Over the years of counseling, I've heard some of the most horrific stories about abuse and sexual abuse that's been. It's just horrible what people will do. To another person. To a child. And it never ceases to amaze me. When they finish telling me their story. And they say but praise God. He saved me. And they're smiling. And it's like wow. It it just encourages my heart. It's like man. I haven't been through. A fraction of what you've been through. I've had my own challenges, but nothing like that. And yet here you are praising God through all of that. Others will be encouraged when they see us praising him in the midst of our suffering. The great message of the 69th Psalm is when we are troubled, we need to cry out to God. Pour our hearts out to him. He will lift our burdens from us. Remind us of of His steadfast love for us. And then empower us to praise Him. Even while we are yet suffering. This is true in every difficult circumstance in your life. In Psalm 69, it is shown to be true that those who must walk through the floodwaters of persecution, will be saved. That that through all of that struggle, all of those difficulties, we can trust the promises of God to give us a foothold to put our head above water and to catch a breath so that we can keep going. Now, most of the Psalms are messianic in nature. In other words, they are about David, but they are also about a future David. 
And this psalm is the third most quoted psalm in the New Testament. And I want to read to you a couple of those quotations and where and how they fall. Psalm 69, 9 is quoted in John 2, 17. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume you or will consume me. And then Psalm 64, 4 is quoted in John 15, 25. But the word that was written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. In Psalm 69, 9, B, the second half of that verse, is quoted in Romans 15, 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. In Psalm 69, 22 through 23, that's quoted in Romans 11, 9 through 10. And, then, and there he's speaking of Israel, and David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. Psalm 69, 25 is quoted in Acts 1, 20. Speaking of Judas, one of Jesus' brothers that betrayed him, for it was written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. Psalm sixty nine twenty one is quoted many times, but um, John nineteen twenty eight through 29, it says, after this, Jesus knowing that all was now finished said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst and a jar full of sour wine stood there And they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. This psalm, with the exception of the two verses of David confessing his sinfulness, because our Lord and Savior had no sinfulness, is pointing to Jesus. Jesus was the one that was ultimately persecuted without any cause, right? And it's the finished work of Jesus that leaves us this morning with two great hopes. The first reason to hope is the faithfulness and steadfast love of God. Psalm 69, 13, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Through Christ this morning, God has guaranteed to save his church through the gospel. Jesus has promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In addition, his covenant love rests on believers so that as the prophet Zechariah said, he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Zechariah 2.8. Knowing this, in the worst of our afflictions, we may take up Psalm 69 and pray with David and Jesus, Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Our second and greatest hope in prayer is the finished work of Christ our Redeemer. After being offered that sour wine and having exhausted the penalty of our sins on the cross, Jesus cried out in the next verse, John 19, 30, it is finished. It's finished. This was the final ground on which David prayed, hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul. Redeem me. Ransom me. Because of my enemies. Jesus knew the enemies that would destroy us this morning. Sin, Satan, the world's hatred, death itself. And he redeemed us from all by his own blood. Securing for us the blessings of our Father this morning. None of us can truly claim that we suffer completely 
without cause. Every one of us is sinful to hear this morning. But Jesus truly did suffer without cause. Jesus suffered to win our salvation. Jesus alone suffered to restore our relationship with God. Dying to to reconcile sinners back to their maker. And this is how we can know that God hears our prayers. Because the Savior who sits on the throne above is the Christ who suffered for our sins. He is the great intermediary. He is our great high priest. And he hears the prayers of his people. Through our trials and our sorrows that that Savior is not destroying us, but is saving us by strengthening our faith. Even during the most challenging times when we feel like we can't take it any more. When you find yourself on the point of just giving up and everything seems like it's falling apart, we can still have faith in God by believing in Christ that things are actually falling together for our good. No matter how exhausted we are from waiting, like David, (laughs) we can find peace in the fact that we can call on him this morning and, and trust our faith will endure because of what he did on the cross. It is finished. Draw near to my soul, we pray. From Psalm 69. Redeem me, we pray this morning. Through faith in Jesus, the Savior, who prayed Psalm 69 for our sake, we can pray it back to God for his. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to This morning, if you're here and you do not know the abundant mercy and love of God, I pray that this morning would be the morning that you would turn to him. And that he in turn would turn to you, save you. Giving you his steadfast love to step out of that miry pit. This This is a work that's only done through his spirit this morning. And I pray that for each and every one of you here that's hearing my voice this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son to die for your enemies. Lord, that's what we were. We were enemies. We wanted nothing to do with you. And yet in your steadfast, abundant love and mercy. You chose to make a way when there was no way. God, we praise you for that. this morning. And Lord, I just want to pray for those who are struggling and who are suffering under persecution this morning. Whatever that may look like. God, I pray that your spirit would be with them. I pray that this message would encourage them, that that they would read through Psalm 69 this week to, to remind them of your steadfast love that you have for us. And that, Lord, that would become a stepping stone to help them push their head above the waters that feel like they're drowning them. I don't, I don't know the circumstances of all the people in this room, but I, I know... With this many people, there's a lot of suffering happening right now. God, thank you for giving us psalms like Psalm 69 that that, that don't sugarcoat or, or candy coat our lives, but God, reveal the honesty of the state of the world that we live in and the persecution that we're going to experience while pointing us back to your steadfast love throughout 
all of it. Lord, I just pray for each and every person that's in this room struggling. I pray first that their hope and their trust is in you and you alone. And second, I pray that you would use us as a church to be the hands and feet, to be the body of Christ, to to give an embrace, a hug, support, whatever that may look like, God, that you would use us to help each other come out of that miry clay and to not feel like we're sinking in. Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.